I'm going to repeat that because I just forgot to turn on the recording. So I just want to say again, welcome everybody to the Local Women's Voices for Peace Conference. And welcome to this session. Um, this is the final session for today. And uh, it's wonderful to have all of you here and thank you for staying with us for the day. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Ms. Sherry Graydon this afternoon. Sherry is the founder and the catalyst of Informed Opinions. She's an award-winning author and she's a women's advocate. Um, Sherry is a former newspaper columnist and she's a TV producer here in Canada. She's also a commentator for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation Radio, CBC, as well as the TV National Channel. And since 2010, she's been helping to amplify the voices of thousands of women across Canada and supporting them in sharing their insights with the broader public. So what I know about informed opinions is it really is, it really does have the mission of elevating women's voices across media and ensuring that women are ready and, and, uh, and, and able and capable of, um, of expressing their voice, of having their voice heard in, effectively in media and not being afraid of it. And I think this is what I've really come to um, appreciate about Sherry is her way, the ways in which she's helped all of us. Um, so Sherry, I'm gonna turn over to you. And just before I do that, I wanna remind everybody that we're recording this session so that many other people can also benefit from the session. We actually have another session running concurrently right now, which is also, I know, a challenge for some of you who wanted to be in both. Um, and uh, we'll be making this available on our website. Um, Sherry, maybe at the end of the session also, you can share your contact details in case people wanna get in touch with you. Um, Sherry also offers a whole range of, uh, of courses and, and programs. So Sherry, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really an honor to join you all. And I'm sorry that I have not had the opportunity to participate in other sessions. It sounds like it's been a fabulous conference. I'm going to start by telling you a story that I tell at almost the start of pretty much every presentation or speech I give. Uh, for two reasons. One, it's a really effective story that encapsulates the mission of informed opinions. And secondly, stories are among the most powerful things you can do when somebody hands you a mic. So it was about 15 years ago and my partner and I were in Montreal and we were cutting across the, the parking lot of a Catholic church and a TV crew doing streeters approached us and said, the Pope has just died would you comment? And I said, no, I don't think so. And I kept walking. And from behind me, my husband, David, who had not been to church in 40 years, he said, sure, I'll comment. And I turned around stunned, wondering what pearls of wisdom were going to drop from his beautiful mouth. And I watched him bow his head and gravely declare, it's a very sad day for Catholics everywhere. And as we continued our walk onto the old port of Montreal, I turned to him and said, honey, that was a little obvious. And wouldn't it be great if the next Pope, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> were, to <clears throat> were to come up with a progressive policy on birth control that wouldn't <clears throat> trap millions of poor Catholic women around the world in, a, in an endless cycle of childbearing and childrearing. And David looked at me and said, yeah, honey, that, that would have been great. Too bad you turned down the interview. Too bad doesn't actually begin to describe it. First of all, his comments made the national news, even though he said really nothing that contributed. They made the national news, and <clears throat> mine obviously didn't because nobody recorded them. But then when you think about it, most women spend decades of our lives either trying to avoid becoming pregnant, trying to become pregnant, or becoming pregnant and then dealing with the consequences which last forever and change everything, our, our bodies, our brains, our ability to multitask, the way we see the world, the priorities we have, our appreciation and empathy for other human beings and the importance of taking care of each other. And so when our voices are missing in any public conversation, that has profound implications for policies and spending priorities of governments, 
the decisions that corporations and individuals make. And that is the argument that we make at Informed Opinions to encourage women to speak up. And as I mentioned, I tell this story often as a way of reminding women why it's so critical that we move our voices from 25 or 30% of public conversations so that we're up to 50. And a few years after I started Informed Opinions and had been telling this story, I was at a cocktail reception at a university and a woman asked me what I did. And I said, I train smart women to speak up. And she got really excited and she said, oh my God, you've got to meet this woman I was just hearing about. She and her husband were walking across the parking lot of a Catholic church. And she starts telling me my story. She doesn't know my name. She doesn't know Informed Opinions work, but she knows when she hears women needing to speak up, she immediately had the association of the story, even though she hadn't heard it from me, someone else had heard the story from me and then repeated it. And that's really the mark of success when you're presenting, is that you want the people in the room, the people who are listening to you, to absorb the message you're delivering fully enough that they can then share it with others. Because that's the way you spread the um, perspectives and the concerns that, that you are wanting to advocate for. So this is just a start off pitch for the power of stories and they can be shorter or longer than the one I told, but they are among the most effective ways to communicate to others. So I'm going to now turn it over to, uh, to your questions. I have lots of other stories and examples that I'm happy to tell, but I, I really want this session to be as valuable for you as possible. And I'm gonna encourage you to either ask me a question in the chat function, which I have open and I can look at, or, or Eileen can draw my attention to, or you can unmute yourself since we're a small group and um, ask the question that you have that would be most valuable for you in terms of leaving the time we have together with insight that will help you to do better in your own presentation opportunities. So Sherry, why don't I just kick off by asking you to share a little bit of the insights that you gave um, some of the speakers that have been attending the conference as they were thinking about preparing I mean, it's always daunting when you're going into a conference like this and you're thinking about how you can best have impact. So share with us a few of the tidbits that you that you had suggested um, to speakers that can actually apply to any conference or any kind of speaking event that you might have. And then we'll go over to the questions as you suggested. Okay, sure. So one of one of, I guess, the most valuable pieces of takeaway advice that I have is to think about the audience and your purpose and the context before you start working on the message. And that's a little counterintuitive. Most of us, when we know we are about to have a speaking engagement, we think, okay, what am I going to say? And one of the things that I found really valuable as a communicator, as a speaker, as a writer, is to spend even just five minutes before I start writing the content to think about, okay, what is it that I want people to think or do as a result of having heard me? And <clears throat> being really clear and conscious and deliberate about articulating that outcome changes how I approach the rest of the task. So if I'm really clear, okay, I want, I want, in my case, women to embrace every opportunity they have to amplify their voices and share their experience informed insights and so given that that's my goal that then helps me decide if i have five minutes or i have an hour what i'm going to include so knowing your purpose thinking about who am i speaking to what do they know already what do they care about what are they concerned about um, what is it that I can say that will engage them specifically? Not some generic crowd, but the women or the men or the people who are in this room, what do they care about? So thinking really deeply about the audience and then the context in which your remarks are appearing 
are you at the end of a day like I am? Because if you're at the end of the day, you have to generate way more energy than you do at the beginning when people are fresh. So you also want to make it more interactive if it's at the end of the day, because otherwise people are going to tune out. So spending time thinking about the purpose, the audience, and the context, then you can move to, okay, given those things, this is what I'm going to focus my message on. And I think so often we rush to pile in all of the details and the knowledge we have, and we end up with kind of a hot, wet mess sometimes, way more content than the time allows. And so then, when, then we end up speaking really quickly, which is doing nobody a favor. Um, so yeah, that, that would be one of my, my top suggestions. <clears throat> That's excellent. And you know, given the diversity that we have um, today in, in the list of participants that I'm seeing, um, what I'd like to encourage the participants to do is, is to tell us where you are um, and think a little bit about the context you're in. This is an opportunity for you also to share with Sherry and with me some of your expertise and your experience around communicating, um, especially as it is relating to your, um, you know, to your community or your country. So I'm opening the floor and I want to see if you could use the hand signal um, if you'd like to start off. Um, actually, Carrie Lynn, you've typed in something into the chat. Did you want to say that out, out loud uh, for Sherry and begin kicking us off? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have gone to Toastmasters. I speak often in public. It doesn't matter who contacts me, <clears throat> uh, media or you know, my boss <laughs> asking you to speak somewhere. I still am like terrified. <laughs> Does that so, ever go away? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say it goes away. And, and, you know, your question, and thank you for asking it, Carrie Lynn, because I think it's a <clears throat> almost universal experience. Most people and research suggests people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of death. Now, that may be because we don't ever think about death, if we can avoid it, whereas we often have to think about public speaking. But I would say that for me, the, the number one thing that makes me nervous, whether I'm speaking to the media or to a small group or a large group, is the pressure I'm placing on myself to try and appear to be something other than who I am at my most comfortable. And so one of the things that I really encourage people to do is to spend a little time reflecting on who are you at your absolute most relaxed, intelligent, engaging, funny? Who are you with the people who know and love you, whether it's your girlfriends after you've had a glass of wine and you're totally without pretension spend some time thinking about and, and, and feeling the physicality of who you are in those moments. And all of us, especially if you're being invited to speak anywhere publicly, it means that other people have already identified you as one, somebody who can communicate effectively, and two, somebody who has knowledge and insight that will be of value to others. And so, you, you're getting that affirmation by the very invitation to speak. And who are you to question that? Who are you to question the wisdom of that invitation? And so then you reflect on, yes, I speak very competently to people every day in my work life, in my personal life. I know stuff, I have perceptions and insights. And so you remind yourself of that. You know, I read something recently that that our self-talk, the voice in our head, delivers between, I forget what it was, a hundred or, I don't know, a thousand words a minute, between 300 and a thousand words a minute, we are delivering to ourselves in our head. And so if our self-talk is, oh my God, my mouth is gonna dry up, I'm gonna forget what I meant to say, I'm not as intelligent as these people, they probably know more than I do. If we're reinforcing that in our brain, that's really a recipe for nerves. And so it's replacing that self-talk with the reinforcement that, yeah, I know stuff. That's why they asked me to speak. I'm really competent at 
you know, relaying a message. That's why they've asked me to speak. And the minute you take away the pressure uh, to be perfect or the most knowledgeable and you just accept that I'm going to get to show up as who I am and people will either benefit or they won't. But, you know, I was invited and I'm speaking. And if it's not me, this is one of the key messages for informed opinions. If I say no, or if I defer to somebody else, the problem, the likelihood is they're going to go to some guy and he's going to say yes. And he's not any more intelligent or articulate than I am, but he's then going to get the benefit of the, of the profile. So I hope that's helpful to you, Carrie Lynn and, and, and the rest of you. And I have a couple of other concrete suggestions and you may have heard these at Toastmasters, but um, drinking water uh, before you go on lubricates your vocal cords and your brain, makes the synapses work better so you can think on your feet. Um, breathing for the five minutes or 10 minutes uh, before you're about to speak. If you do yoga or meditate and you, you know, are accustomed to bringing big breaths in, that helps slow down your, your stress hormones and absolutely allows your nerves to feel um, you know, more comfortable. Those are also really useful practical suggestions. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm seeing in the, in the chat that Andrea, um, who is also working with us at Cody, has made a comment. Andrea, did you want to share that with, uh, with uh, Sherry and the group? Sure. Um, so, hi, kind of dark here. Um, so what I was what I was meaning to say is that um, like sometimes I get asked to speak places and you know I just try to really think about what it's going to feel like what it's going to look like who's going to be there um, and and what needs to be said and then I think about the content and where we're at or whatever and then when it comes right just time to be at the mic um, it just feels like all of that falls away and I just say whatever I say. And I never remember what I say, but I always have people saying, hey, that was great. That was great. That was great. <laughs> and I just really believe and feel like because I, I do like it's not so much a meditation, but kind of more like a, a prayer. Like, you know, um, please just let all the words come that need to come. And I just trust that I've been asked to do this and it will be fine. And I don't get nervous or anything until after I'm done after I leave the mic, then I'm like, oh my God, what did I just do? But going up there, I have no problem with that, that part. But yeah, so it's, and then speaking from notes, like I can, I can refer to them, but I don't really like stick to all the notes because I really feel like I want to talk to people where um, I feel comfortable that I'm really relating to people. As I'm talking to one person, I would talk to 10,000 people. Like, I just really want to give that feeling and vibe off. So that's what I mean by that. Okay, Andrea, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I have three thoughts from, from what you said. One is I want to reinforce uh, the power of mental visualization that you talked about, where you imagine it in advance. And that's also something I do. In fact, if I know I'm going to speak at, in a venue and I haven't been to the venue before, I get the organizers to send me photographs of the venue so I can visually imagine myself in that room, on that stage, <clears throat> behind that lectern or at the microphone. And if I arrive at a conference the night before in pre-COVID times, I would go to the room where the meeting was happening the next day. I would go do that the night before again so I could, like Andrea, visually imagine myself there. And there is science behind the, <clears throat> the impact of that. Your brain does not know the difference between a real and a vividly imagined event. That's why we get so emotionally hooked into movies and TV shows when we watch them. And so if you allow your brain to visually imagine yourself, not just in the room, but speaking comfortably, engaging an audience, uh, having them respond appropriately, laughing or crying or applauding and being with you, 
um, it's much easier for your physical self to replicate that success that your brain has already imagined. So I so appreciate, Andrea, you bringing that up. That's number one thing. One of the other things that I want to comment on is the fact that you don't remember what you said immediately after. And what that suggests to me is that you are so present in the moment that you are doing what you set out to do, which is to talk to the people in the room, look them in the eye, and respond to the way that they're responding. And even though you may be the only one speaking, they are responding in a visceral way. They're leaning in, they're tuning out, they're talking to each other. You, you can have an energy experience of how they're responding. And so if you are present in the moment with the people in the room, um, that makes it understandable that you don't recall immediately afterwards what you said because you were focusing on connecting with the people in the room instead of saying words that you had planned in advance. So that's, that's a, really, a really powerful thing. And then to the point about notes, I almost always have some notes. I've done some preparation. I've thought about what I want to say. But like you, if I, and I have notes on the side of my desk here right now on the side of my computer, so that if you don't have enough questions, I'll have additional things to say. But you can't really communicate with people and connect with people if you're not making eye contact, assuming that you are not visually impaired. But if you are focusing your attention on a piece of paper in front of you or your notes on the computer like this, it's very hard for the rest of you to feel like I'm connecting with you if I'm not actually looking at you. And so although notes are useful to prepare yourself mentally so that you've thought in advance about what you want to focus on, you really don't want to have to read them in any situation where you want people to stay engaged. So great points. Thank you for all of them. One more question. So about the focus and looking at the computer and stuff, like what do you suggest for like uh, sharing uh, PowerPoint slides in, in like a Zoom meeting? So I often do that. I often uh, do workshops where I have slides and in Zoom you can, when you share your screen, you can pick um, uh, where you share a portion of your screen only and so I have my slides in the corner of my desk and I know what they are and I can look over at them like that. But I'm still way more interested in doing what I'm doing now, which is and not all of you have your cameras on, but I'm looking at the camera on my, on my computer um, so that it feels like we're connected and you can still see my slides if I have them because I've shared that portion of the screen but you have the option of both the slides as well as the energy and the communication that I'm trying to make happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a, uh, a point here that's been raised by Re Regina or Regina. Hello everyone. She says, I am a good speaker, but I'm very conscious of my pronunciation and grammar. What is your advice? So are you speaking English as a second language? Is that what your concern is about, Andrea? This is a Regina. That's um, oh, Regina, Regina, are you, sorry. Regina, yeah. are you able to unmute and, and uh, answer Sherry's question? Uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, English is my second language. OK. So um, it's understandable. If I had to, on the rare occasions that I have to speak French, I am very preoccupied by those concerns as well. Um, you spoke very, very briefly, Regina, but I had no difficulty understanding you. And I think the fact that you have a little humility and consciousness around wanting to make sure that you're speaking clearly, um, that's obviously valuable. Um, I think most people, listening to somebody speak English as their second language are appreciative that they're able to speak English as their second language in the first place. And, and my experience often is I am thinking when I'm listening to somebody, well, 
she speaks English way better than I would ever speak her language or even the language, the other languages that I speak a little of. Um, what is important is to make sure that you're pronouncing words well enough that people can understand the sense of what you're saying. And my guess is because you're conscious of that and you're raising it, um, you do that. What I sometimes notice when I'm coaching um, people to do media interviews, for example, is that if they do speak English as a second language, and then on top of that, they deliver what they're saying very, very quickly, that's sometimes a recipe for misunderstanding. So I'm gonna make this point more broadly about speed and, and remind you often when we speak, if we're nervous, we end up speaking much more quickly. And what I would suggest is that anytime we speak really quickly, we're robbing our audience of the opportunity to digest and process what we're talking about. So here's what the research shows, that we remember more of what we thought about what you said than about what you said. And so people who speak really quickly, especially if they also have an accent and we have to really work hard to keep up with them and we're having to discern words that are not as clear when we speak fast because we run words together, um, those audiences are less likely to remember and be able to make sense of our message. So if you have an accent, um, making sure that you're speaking at a, at a reasonable pace so people can digest what you're saying and make sense of it as opposed to having to keep up with you. That's, that's the best advice that I can offer. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And um, I'm also seeing uh, Jane says that she is, she feels very shy when she has to make eye contact with her audience. It makes her nervous. How can she overcome it? So I think this is probably also common and it's one of the things that makes people stick to their notes because they feel like if I look up and I make eye contact with people that reminds me that I'm in a room and yeah. And I take the opposite approach in that when I first arrive at a venue where I'm speaking, first of all, I always arrive early so that I, if I can, so that I have an opportunity to interact with people one-on-one -on -one as they arrive in a way that I would if I were going to a barbecue or you know, a picnic <clears throat> where I was just interacting with people where I'm shaking hands, again, pre-COVID, but I'm interacting with people and, and getting to just be myself in the moment and establish a little bit of connection before I have to stand up and formally speak. And doing that, by the time I have the microphone and all eyes are on me, I feel like now I already have a relationship with some of the people in the room. I've, I've shown up as myself. Um, I feel less pressure to be um, somebody else. I feel less pressure to perform. I, I feel like, okay, I'm here just like you know, I was 10 minutes ago when we were chatting uh, together about the weather or the venue or something like that. So that's one of the things I'm really deliberate about is, is allowing myself to feel comfortable in the room with the people. And, and then sometimes what I'll do is I will find a couple of people in the audience who, who are encouraging in their body language. So, you know, in any audience, often there's, there's one person, it's usually a woman, and she's nodding and she's smiling. And so if, if I get nervous, I go back to that one person and hopefully she's in the middle of the audience as opposed to way off in a corner. But um, then that way I feel like, okay, I'm talking to at least one person who's interested and encouraging. And that lowers the stress, the cortisol that, that comes up when you get nervous. Like to see if other there's other questions or comments. Um, somebody was mentioning earlier, um, Sherry, about the use of PowerPoint. Tell me a little, or tell us a little bit more about what you have to say um, in terms of do's and don'ts with PowerPoint presentations. Sure. 
So I use PowerPoint for two kinds of engagements and I use them very, very differently. When I do a workshop where the, the information on my PowerPoint is takeaway messages that I use in very, very um, point form, as few words as possible. Um, so I'll have, I'll have slides that people can quickly make note of if the takeaway is important to them. And I'll use that in a pedagogical framework for a workshop. When I speak, and it's not a workshop, when I'm doing a keynote or even just 10 minutes from a big stage, and it's more um, a motivational or inspirational or uh, you know, a different context than a learning environment, I use very, very little text. I use almost entirely photographs and I try and make the photographs full bleed. So the photograph takes up the entire slide. I make the graphics as simple and clean and clear as possible. And um, what I'm interested in is images that reinforce the message that I'm delivering and provide an additional layer of emotional connection rather than detailed graphs or or um, charts that you know people have to lean in to to look at and make sense of because coming back to the research here here again is what we know is that if you have a complex slide with lots of text on it and by lots of text i mean more than 15 or 20 words never mind 100 words and i've seen lots of really bad slides with that much data on them if you have a really text rich slide and you're talking, the audience has to make a choice between listening to you or reading your slide. They cannot do both. They simply can't. Even if they have PhDs, their brain cannot do both. And so they have to choose. And then you're faced with an audience who has either, list, some people have listened to you, some people have tried to make sense of the slide, but most people are frustrated because they can't do both and they don't know which one to pay attention to. So I keep the information on my slides always as concise and focused as possible. And then I use the words that I'm saying to um, invite people into the emotional, intellectual issue that I want them to grasp hold of. Mm, and very, very fewer, good points. Yeah. Fewer slides is better than more. Exactly. Um, and I guess I would add one thing there, and that is when you don't actually spell check your slides. That's also oh, yeah, that's good. bad. <laughs> for, for some people, it can be a real turn off. Um, Sherry, I was wondering if we could turn over to sort of just talking a little bit about media and working a bit more with the media. And there, I mean, obviously, there's many different forms of, of uh, connecting with the media. And what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in terms of the way um, women are responding to media? You gave a very good example, but I'm thinking now about how you present yourself in media, especially if it's a visual media or even if it's radio. Is there, are there tips or, or things that you would share here, knowing we don't have lots of time, but some key things that you would point out for the, uh, the listeners today? Yeah, let's, let's start with television because that's probably the most intimidating medium for all of us, me included, to engage in. And, you know, television, it is by definition a visual medium. And so people will, they cannot help but focus on how you look. And so if you're going on television, you too sadly need to pay attention to how you look. And there are a few simple things that I think are universally useful reminders. One is that you don't want anything about your physical appearance that you have control over to be unnecessarily distracting. So for example, I never, I have lots of much more interesting earrings than the little pearls that I'm wearing now, but I move my head a lot when I talk. And if I were wearing dangly earrings, they would be moving and catching the light and that is distracting. So simple things like that. Um, I sometimes will notice people being interviewed on television and they have elaborate jewelry around their neck. It's not moving in the way earrings do, but 
it is visually attracting my attention and distracting me from paying attention to what it is that they are saying. So my goal when I go on television or when I'm at the front of the room is to dress in a way that's appropriate for my culture and my role and the message that I wanna deliver. And so that may be very different depending where you live and the kind of work that you're doing. But I seek to dress in a nondescript but professional way. I pick a color that flatters me. There are only two of them. So my whole wardrobe is full of those colors. And um, yeah, I, I position myself in a Zoom world if you go on television in normal times, the camera operator will frame you the way that works. In this environment, you want to frame yourself the way I have. So you want to make sure that you haven't cut off your head or that you don't have a whole bunch of ceiling ahead of you. You want to be generally in the center of the, the camera. You want to have not too much distracting stuff behind you. And um, you want to look into the camera when you're speaking. For radio, I would say that one of the underappreciated things about radio is it's considered a warmer medium than television. And there's just something about hearing voices divorced from visuals that is less distracting for sure, but it allows us to pay attention more closely to the words and to the tone. And so here's something people don't realize. I'm smiling right now as I deliver this content. And on radio, if you were to all close your eyes, you would be able to hear the smile in my voice. And so thinking about that personality, you know, we think, well, people can't hear me, therefore I can just, I mean, they can't see me, so I can just sort of deliver my information. But what you really want to focus on when you're doing any kind of broadcast interview or you're being recorded is that you're making a connection with the person who's asking you the questions that you have a relationship with another human being and that includes being warm and human and that translates to the audience and even though they might not be able to articulate or notice specifically oh she's smiling now they will notice the warmth and the connection that you are establishing with the person who's interviewing you. So those are two points that I would make about broadcast in, in particular. I'm happy to talk about doing print interviews mm -hmm. if, and if there isn't another mm -hmm. question. I'll just make one comment about the, the dressing appropriate for culture. I do, I have heard that advice before about, you know, be careful not to be too distracting. But I do want to emphasize that I also I recognize for many cultures um, it's a representation of who you are in, in terms of the way that you're dressing. So I think it, the context really does matter, I think. And also, I, I'm, I'm increasingly seeing many people, especially in the North American context, where, you know, they're, they're making extra statements by what they're wearing, whether it's a statement across a shirt and so on. So I'm just reflecting a little bit on the way in which sometimes the authenticity comes with what they're wearing. That, that can be really distracting. So knowing when you want that and when you don't want that distraction, I think is important. Well, no, I think your point is really well taken because um, I, I said, I want something that's relevant to my role and my goal and my culture. And so the choices I make absolutely will not be universal for everyone. And, and because it is a visual medium, if you have the capacity um, to relay through your clothing choices um, something that reinforces the message that you want to deliver, then that's like me choosing images for my PowerPoint that reinforce the message that I'm going to deliver. So Eileen, thank you for adding that nuance because I, I think that is really important what you've said. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging people to come forward and put up their hand if they have questions. I am seeing another question in the chat box about what do you do when you get emotional when you're speaking? Do you have tips for staying focused? So I, I cry easily and often and I have sometimes been at the front of a room telling a story, even one that I've told many times before or going off onto a tangent and telling a story that I hadn't intended to tell that, tell that chokes me up. 
And um, I guess I would say two things. One is that most audiences, if you are, if you are speaking about something that is by definition emotionally moving, that is deeply human, that has implications that are emotional and you get choked up, you want to breathe and give yourself permission to take 20 seconds. The 20 seconds to you will feel like five minutes, but people are generally very generous, I've noticed in audiences, and seeing you be moved is often moving to them and gives them a deeper experience of the story or the issue that you're talking about. So first of all, give yourself a break and don't immediately go into this, oh my God, I can't believe I'm getting emotional. This is so embarrassing. Don't do that. Just acknowledge that you are opening up a space in the room for people to feel. And, and we all need to feel more often. That's one of my suggestions. The second thing that I would suggest is a very practical strategy. And that is that when you become emotionally overwhelmed and if you're really worried about losing it and you don't want to, understandably, what you do is you focus your eyes on something physical and concrete. So I remember doing this um, in, a, in a big conference hall and there was a water jug on the table right near me. I was speaking from behind the table, but I got emotional and I just lowered my eyes and I looked at the water jug and I specifically made my brain describe the water jug to myself. There was condensation right, running down it. It was a glass water jug. It was round, not straight. And, and just five seconds of making my concentration and my focus on that physical water jug took me out of the really emotional place that I had been in the moment before. And then that allowed me to continue speaking. I hope that's helpful. Maybe others of you have strategies or experiences that would be useful to share. I'm seeing uh, Andrea say awesome. And um, uh, while you're talking, Sherry, just in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm doing uh, my own version of closed captioning at the moment. So it's thank you great. very much. Um, another question coming um, in, a, in a workshop or an educational setting, do you list your education? Do you have a slide with references at the end? I think I'm, I think I understand what you're asking there. Um, what yeah, your so I, I understand the importance of establishing your credibility. And if you're in a situation where somebody else is introducing you, as Eileen did with me, often the introduction establishes your credibility. Sometimes there will be a printed program or an online program that gives the bio so that people know who you are. It is really useful to, to have that done for you. If that hasn't been done for you, and sometimes I'm delivering workshops where nobody's there to introduce me. I arrive at a university, I set up, I do the workshop. Um, in those circumstances, I don't usually list my qualifications. What I do though, is I will often make passing reference, and I'm pretty deliberate about this, I will refer to some of the things that Eileen said about me to establish my credibility. So I'll say, you know, I've been at this for 30 years and what I notice is, so that makes really clear that I've been doing this a long time. Or I'll say, um, when I did regular commentary for CBC Radio, one of the things that I learned was um, or, you know, we've trained more than 3,500 women across Canada to write op-eds and hundreds of them have published. And so I'm going to share some of the strategies that we've shared with them. So I, I work to integrate references to my credibility in a way that doesn't feel like me saying, okay, I have this degree and that degree and, and is sort of woven into my comments, which, which feels more natural for me. But depending on your circumstances, um, again, it depends on the audience and the context and your purpose. Um, if it's really important for the audience you're speaking to, that they know that you have a PhD or a master's degree, um, you, you do want to establish that at the beginning and you could make your title slide include your 
degree, you know, Sherry Graydon MA or Dr. Um, so-and-so to make clear what your credential is. <clears throat> Seeing an interesting tip um, that Carrie Lynn has shared um, in terms of when you're feeling nervous or emotional, the tip is to raise your toes on one foot. Your mind cannot concentrate on doing both. Okay, now I'm raising my toes right now as we speak at the desk. Um, that sounds that sounds like an interesting tip. Is it? It's worked. It's worked well for you, Carrie Lynn. I did try it. It was a uh, somebody who is a police off retired police officer, and she is a, also a psychologist. And she's she's um when they put people under uh, not a spell, but what's that called? Uh, Hypnotize. Yeah, she's a hypnotist. And then she she gave me this tip. So I've tried it and it you and it worked for me. Uh, so let me know if it works for you. That's a great suggestion. I've made note of that. I'm going to try it myself. Thank you. Are there other questions for Sherry? I'm just taking a look at the list here and don't hesitate to either open up your mic or raise your hand. <laughs> While, while you're thinking of additional questions, um, let me share one of the other pieces of advice that I have for all speakers, and that is to use the first few minutes as strategically as you can. So audiences are almost always gonna give you the benefit of the doubt <clears throat> for the first two minutes. And what you do with those first two minutes is really, really important. I was at a conference in a small town in Canada a few years ago, and it was a very packed program. There wasn't a lot of space for networking in between, and we were already behind schedule. And the woman who came up to speak, she had 10 minutes on the agenda. We knew that because we all had the agenda. And at the front of the room, right next to her, was a woman doing graphic recording, where she was drawing pictures of what the speakers said, and for the first five minutes of this woman's talk, she just held her pen aloft and there was nothing for her to draw because the woman was simply saying things like, oh, I'm so happy to be here and I see people in the audience I know and I used to attend this institution. And she was in no way delivering the content that she had been asked to deliver. She was wasting the first five minutes at, at the front and we all knew that she only had 10 minutes and finally and it was really underlined by the fact that the graphic recorder had nothing to write and finally one of the organizers said okay you have five minutes left and she said oh my god i haven't even started and everybody in the room went silently yeah we know so the first thing out of your mouth is the one that you really want to think about and you want to start as powerfully as you can, bringing the audience into the importance of what you're talking about and doing that in concrete ways. So not speaking theoretically, not using big conceptual words, but describing something that they can picture, uh, telling them a story, allowing them to imagine how the people who are affected by the issue you're talking about feel, you, you want to bring them in emotionally and, and stories or visuals or provocative questions that get them thinking and feeling themselves are the best way I know to do that. And so, yeah, I think the way you start is, is really powerful. You know, that also reminds me, Sherry, of, you know, the number of times where when we're speaking, um, and again, this is a cultural uh, thing, but there's often a lot of protocols that are observed observed, sorry. Um, and that takes up time, right? Especially when um, everybody is repeating the same protocols. So I think it, you know, from what I, my own experiences is you have to, you just have to know where, you know, where you're going in and what's, what is, um, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So as an example, what would have been appropriate for me starting this session, which I did not do, was to give a proper land acknowledgement. We had done it at the beginning of the conference, but we've been trying to make sure we do it in every session. And I did not do that. And I feel very, you know, acutely aware of that. Other times though, there's a lot of, well, I want to thank everybody. And, and so there's, there seems to be a, 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 you know, a balance that you need to, to achieve. 
Um, but any same thoughts for you or anything that you would add to that? Yeah, so you're absolutely right, of course. And as the organizer of an event, um, you you do want to do the land acknowledgement, um, you know, pay respect uh, in that way. And sometimes if it's a formal event and there are dignitaries in the room, you need to formally acknowledge their presence. And so all of those things are important and of course need to be taken into consideration. Um, and every circumstance will be different, but it, it comes back to one of the things that I said at the very beginning, which was thinking about what is my purpose, who is my audience, and then what is the context? And if the context is, um, you know, it's important to observe some of those protocols, then, um, then it's necessary for you to do that because if the audience in the room is expecting it and you don't, then they're distracted by by your failure to to behave appropriately yeah and thank you very much to my colleagues who are sharing the land acknowledgement um which is uh very important for all of our work so thank you um so i'm just checking i think i saw also another uh question um just want to make sure i didn't miss it any, so here's one for you. Any tips for the moderators, Sherry, about helping the panelists make them come out and amplify their voices? So you started, you did cover some of this. Um, those that are, you know, trying to develop a, con you know, a connection between the conversation, especially when you're already in a panel and maybe there's been other speakers before you and you're trying to make a connection also um, to the other speakers to, to maybe improve the flow of the, of the, the panel. Any suggestions or any tips in that respect? For the moderator or, um, yeah, I, I, I think the challenge on a panel often is to, um, I mean, ideally there's good work done before the panel happens so that people know what perspective others are gonna bring and that they're complementary. Um, so that you don't have people just saying, oh yeah, I agree with her, but, but that you build, as you mentioned, on and, and add an extra dimension to what somebody else has said. So I think on a panel, it's really important that everybody, moderator, as well as all the panelists are listening deeply, not, you know, while one person is speaking, you don't want the other people to be buried in their notes trying to imagine well what am i going to say you should have done that before and because you do want to it, you do want it to be a conversation an ideal panel feels like a conversation between knowledgeable people where you are indeed listening to and building off of and the moderator um, has to be especially adept at, at listening, at knowing enough about what each of the panelists brings to the discussion so that she can make the bridge between what the first woman has said and the next woman has said so that it feels like a seamless flow of, of conversation. I, I don't know the, um, you know, I don't have any quick tips for, for getting good at that necessarily, but um, well, here's one thing that I would say, and this applies to all kinds of presentation situations, is that most of us will spend a lot more time watching other people speak and present than we will ourselves. And I have a notebook with me every time I go to, well, I always have a notebook with me. So anytime I'm in a situation where somebody's speaking at the front of the room, I am taking notes. And if I'm not taking notes about their content, I am absolutely paying attention to what it is that they're doing effectively and ineffectively so that I can improve my own ability to communicate effectively from the front of a room. And so when I see somebody do a fabulous job of moderating, I pay attention to, well, what is it that is making this conversation so rich? And I take note of that and then I look to apply that in, in my own life. I am just making sure that Michelle is getting all of this. Um, 
I see that we've got about three minutes left. Um, Mary, any last words for these women leaders as they move on in their own leadership journeys and they're thinking about, um, you know, the times where they think they might not be the best person to speak. So circling back to the beginning when you talked about the example of you and your partner, um, any last sort of words of, of wisdom or advice or inspiration that you'd like to give our, our listeners today? Maybe I'll talk to you about the Venn diagram that I cite often when I'm encouraging and supporting uh, women to own their expertise and speak up. So when women get invited to speak, often our immediate first thought is, well, I'm not the best person. And I just want to say that's almost never the ask. That's almost never the bar. And so I'm going to invite you all, when you get invited to speak anywhere, that you buy yourself five minutes and you draw a Venn diagram. And in one circle, you put this is what the journalist or the conference organizer is looking for in terms of content. And then you draw the second circle. And in the second circle, you put this is what I know. This is what my experience, my education, my work, my personal life have given me in terms of insight that relates to this topic. And then you look at the intersection of the two circles and there will be an intersection or you wouldn't have been asked in the first place. And then you say to the journalists or the conference organizer, here's what I can talk about. Here's the value I can add because that's what they're after is that you have some value to add again or they wouldn't have asked you in the first place and if you focus on what it is you know that can enhance people's understanding of something and you forget about all of the chatter in the back of your head about what you don't know because that's what we do as women we focus on our in our the things that we're not good enough about you need to focus on what it is you know and step up and share that because the world will be transformed if women have more opportunity to share what we know. And I'm guessing you all know that and that's why you're doing the work that you're doing and are part of this conference. What they know. Okay, thank you so much. I mean, uh, I do have a final question in here about do you use humor or self-deprecation? I tend to use self-deprecation quite a lot. Sometimes I don't know if it's so effective. Uh, any last thoughts on that, Sherry, and then we'll let you go. I use humor all the time. I often am self-deprecating and um, I do it partly because that's who I am in the rest of my life and it makes me feel more comfortable. And the minute somebody has smiled or laughed in response to something I've said, then I give myself permission to show up fully as who, who I am. So I use it. Um, I have heard criticism of people who use it in circumstances where being self-deprecating undermines their credibility and authority. So you want to again think about the context and circumstances, but in most circumstances I would say there's a value in demonstrating humility because it makes people more receptive to what you're saying. So much. So thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sherry, for your insights. Um, and for, uh, to all of you that joined and asked so many great questions. Um, I do want to acknowledge, um, um, again, that um, we've got two more days of, of great sessions. If you haven't already done so, please go to our website and register for the conference. There's also an online discussion that's actually very active. So if you have other questions or issues, or maybe you have good advice that you want to share to others that have been part of this session, then please go onto the website and do add to that. Um, really appreciate it. And for Michelle, thank you very much. Um, Michelle, thank you for being um, uh, uh, tolerant of my typing. Uh, and for pushing me to make sure that this was available to you. Um, and also, um, in terms of some of the work that you, you were asking around 
our Indigenous uh, leadership programming or our work on Indigenous reconciliation. Um, I do recommend you take a look at our website. We, we, we're doing quite a lot of work um, and Carrie Lynn Paul is the program lead as well as Andrea Curley. Lots of great um, um, initiatives that are happening that are specifically designed for and by Indigenous women leaders. So we're really pleased to be part of that um, at Cody and to, and to continue to work with Indigenous communities around us, especially Mi'kmaq, where we are currently um, located. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Sherry, and have a great afternoon. We'll see everybody again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.